Eric. Yeah. Do you ever feel at a loss for some positivity? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah? Yeah. There's definitely yeah. some- Me too. Some darker days. Yeah. You know. Sure. Yep. Um, usually it's before so- my coffee- um, but even sometimes after, yeah. <laughs> well, at least at least you're less aware yes, at that point. That's right. <laughs> but we all go through that. Sometimes it defines your day or your week or your month. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's just a few moments of your day. But I find when I read these letters from our listeners, I always walk away with something positive. Definitely, even when they are uh, um, some tough stories to uh, for these people to share. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, that also just shows that there's a connection uh, between us and, and and that and the fans. People might assume, yeah. obviously, it makes you feel good when people compliment you, but w- when they share those tough stories and how they endure, mm-hmm. yep, and w- or when they talk about the things that they're really into, mm-hmm. right? And I, I I just find it's those letters that really lift me up the most. Yeah, definitely, I agree with you. Well, I'm excited to dive back in. What do you say? I say, let's get to it. Welcome to The Heart of the Cards, a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Hey, this is Dan Green. And Eric Stewart. And this is part two of episode 30, Listener's Letters. Ooh, great alliteration on that. I I love that. (laughs) Thank you. I came up with that myself. (laughs) I'm impressed. Nice. Yes. Well, I was like working on the thumbnail and uh, I was like, what's the most concise way? And then I had to make sure I would put the apostrophe in the right place for listeners. Almost like Mother's (laughs) Day, right? Yeah. It's a plural possessive. Yeah. Right. uh, Yeah. yeah. So diving back into these wonderful letters, uh, I think we should start with Chris and let's let's give this one to you, Eric. I think he has something more specific to you. Oh, okay. So, uh. Chris writes, Hi, Eric and Dan. Hey, Chris. Been listening through the ESB discography. As both creators (laughs) and consumers, what are your thoughts on how the world has changed for original bands, specifically rock subgenre groups, finding an audience to listen? Hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, For those of you who are not familiar with ESB, it is not Empire Strikes Back in my world. What? Nope. It is Eric Stewart Band. Um, And thank you, Chris, for uh, listening to my music. Uh, Hmm. Well, you know, it's it's it it has changed a lot, Um, especially uh, the there's definitely some pros and some cons. I think some of the pros are that more and more people are able to create uh, quality music on their own without having to uh, necessarily break yeah, the bank yeah. um, mm-hmm. and also just being able to uh, get their music out there. Now, of course, the cons might be that there's so much stuff, it's very hard to uh, uh, rise to the surface and, uh, and, and have someone find you or, 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 or at least um, uh, not only find you but share your music so that you can uh, get some more listeners. But... Um, the the thing that really it, it, to me is is such a is such a struggle is mm. um i think that some of the some of the social media platforms and things like that are sort of throttling stuff um i know mm. i know that mm-hmm. in the beginning of you know cuz i'm an old man so of course you know think talking about things like you know myspace remember when that first came out and wait it was, who's and, and it was <laughs> and it was geared towards like music right there was actually a music player on your page so it was more right. it was really for bands and you know, people would hear your music and you'd share and you'd sort of network. And that was, and that was really mm-hmm. cool. Um, mm-hmm. Facebook comes along and you, and you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. I can reconnect with all my friends and find new friends and share my, you know, share my music, my gigs and stuff like that. But then it started right. to shift into, um, well, not all of your friends are going to see every one of your posts unless you pay for that. And I'm like, hey, I- I'm sorry, Facebook, but you didn't get me my friends. I got me my friends. <laughs> um, but I think that that part has just made it even harder to get your stuff out there. And whether you're doing stuff mm. with TikTok or, you know, uh, things like that. I think the the short attention span is um, also a negative for a lot of um, rock bands. And, and I'm and sorry, what did you say? <laughs> ah! that's funny it's terrible though yeah right it's terrible though. Uh, yeah i feel like i feel like you know there were some the, when you had to play an album like a vinyl record 
right? Two sides. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. you didn't get up every two seconds and skip songs because that was just too much of a drag. You'd put the record on and you'd listen <laughs> and you'd do things around your house. And you might grab right, your right, your right. tennis racket and pretend you're playing air. You it's know, more guitar. of a relationship, more of a yeah. And you had to sit through what we would consider filler songs or just album tracks because, you know, right. you didn't want to get up and skip song two or skip song four. Um, and because of that, those songs also grew on you. Um, there are Beatles yeah, songs yeah. that you would never hear on the radio, but you heard over and over again because you played the actual album. Um, right, right. And some and some albums certainly in the prog rock days, mm-hmm. are designed as total listening experiences. Sure. A storytelling element. Or, yeah. yeah. I mean, I still sequence my my albums. For, oh, yes. That's a part of yeah. any good, uh, yes, curating of your songs. Yeah. But, for but se- you know what I mean, yeah, too. Yeah, oh, like, totally. Like, like the wall. Yes. Like, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There's and, no quiet part. <laughs> and, and a lot of times, you know... Um, uh, you might have like a, a live album, which was like, oh, right. well, well, we, sure. we left off yeah. songs because they didn't fit on that LP, right? right. Um, and then when they right. reissued them on CD, limitation. you're like, oh, there was another 10 songs? Yeah, because we can fit them. And then you're like, well, now it's streaming. It's like, oh, my goodness, that concert was three hours long? Um, so there's all sorts of things that have shifted in terms of the presentation of it. In terms of trying to stand out, you know— I don't know the secret. Uh, you know, I've been I've been doing mm-hmm. music for a very long time, and there's sometimes I'll post a new song or a new video or something, and you know, it gets kind of a little bit of traction, and people are digging it, and you're like, wow, I I really thought people would really connect to that one, and then you post something that's oh, this is an obscure little thing I did, and then all of a sudden it gets all these you know plays and shares, and you're like, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. why is it because of the the actual quality and the content, or was it less throttled? Did somebody it let you know open the floodgates and let it out there. I don't know, but I will say, mm-hmm. I know this is a long winded answer to this short little letter, but I will say this: <laughs> I I have gotten to the point now where the person that I I really am trying to please the most when it comes to songwriting and creation with my music is really myself. Um, mm-hmm. I I find that I I I want to enjoy listening back to the things that I've created, um, mm-hmm. you know, with with some sort of, uh, you know, I really liked what I was doing. Oh, I remember what I was going through during that time. Or, wow, this is a really fun song to sing along to. And sometimes when I've stepped away from from albums and come back to them even years later, I, I'm like, that's fun. This is a fun project because you're so much in the heat of it when you're working on it that... You know, in that in that year that you've worked on it and put it out there, you're like, oh, the last thing I really want to do is listen to this album again. Um, But coming back to it after a little bit and still finding something that you're like, wow, I like this. um, That's really all that matters. So the the audience is the bonus to me. And it does mean a lot when people connect to the music. It does mean a lot when people say, I love, I love this song. You know, I, I, I think it's it's uh, it's amazing or I I can't stop singing it good or bad. Um, (laughs) <laughs> but, but yes, I, I, I really, I think that so much has changed and I do like the fact that the, the accessibility of being able to create is just so much easier for the creators out there. And it's somewhat of a mixed bag. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My wife, um, was also a singer songwriter mm-hmm. and she was describing to me, and this is around just like 2000, how much the industry had changed from the way people are promoted and and just to how, how the industry um, worked more exclusively. And like that was back when radio was even still kind mm. of relevant. Right. And, I mean, there's just so much that's changed. Yeah. And it's easy to get discouraged, but I am so glad that she didn't stop making her music. And she was and, great stuff too. I mean, I absolutely, I, yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, her last album, which was acoustic, she's most of her stuff was like pop rock, mm-hmm. uh, but um, that was uh, changed in terms of the orchestration in her last album, which makes it even a little bit more timeless. But yeah, but so gifted in that way. So keep at it, Chris. Yeah. Even though the, the, these these ways of getting your stuff out there are changing and evolving, um, that shouldn't stop you from doing. Uh, what really inspires you to get your music out there. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, we do have uh, another email from Wham Bam Duel. Uh, in our previous podcast where we read some letters, uh, we read one of his. And he kindly says he doesn't expect us to read his. Uh, and we will move along. But I just want to give a shout out to Wham Bam Duel. Uh, he, also, he sent a link to a video, which was fun to watch. Um, and he has 
uh, his own Yu-Gi-Oh uh, channel thing going. So nice. look up Wham Bam Duel, um, and you will get some uh, cool, fun, engaged, and cogent uh, Yu-Gi-Oh stuff. Mm. Um, and we wish him the best. And thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but the yeah, but the next one we will read is from Fred's. Well, Fred's Dimension, I doubt, is his actual name, so we can put that, we'll yes. put that all out there. Um, and, oh, and just to remind our listeners of the ground rules, we typically don't use last names or surnames. And if we make any mispronunciations uh, or misattributions of uh, pronouns, please forgive us. Uh, we're just doing the best we can, um, and, uh, and we really value that you uh, reached out to us. All right, so from Fred's, greetings, Dan Green and Eric Stewart. I won't lie, I am a huge Yu-Gi-Oh! geek, to the point it drives my family nuts. One rabbit hole I went down was trying to place where a Tem could plausibly fit in the family tree of pharaohs, Hmm. which I have theorized placement for where he could be. But Yu-Gi-Oh! was a big part of my initial creative endeavors, seeing as I got my start in fan fiction. But eventually I made an effort to break into YouTubing, and I am still chipping away at it right now with my channel, Fred's Dimension. It's a role-playing game channel, and I am now steering creative efforts to create a gaming setting that could be used in tabletop games, LARPing, live-action role-playing, and hopefully much more. Suffice it to say, I have a lot of creative projects that I am working on, most of which are interconnected in some way, and I hope that someday amazing people like you can get a chance to see what I have created. See you on the trail of adventure, Fred, Chief Cat Herder for Fred's Dimension. Hmm. Well, I like this a lot for a few different reasons, but the main one is we were just talking about the way that things are changing and getting your stuff out there. YouTube yeah. itself has obviously been one of the hugest parts of that mm-hmm. in the last 10 years or so. And that people can now apply their creativity and put it out there in a way where they're really rising to their own creative expectation. What do I want? How do I want to put it out there? Some people have a more casual approach. Some people have a more polished approach. But there are people who are making their living off of YouTube that didn't exist 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. That's true. Or if it did, it was very rare. I, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers. but um, And I'm a huge fan. I, I started shifting over to watching primarily YouTube several years ago. Um, mainly, I was just following the news and um, on YouTube, you can find a lot of stuff with the commercials taken out. Right. And you know how repetitive news can be. So it's yes. nice to have. I don't need to listen to the Cialis commercial a hundred times. Okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, but, you know, commentary channels. I love the guys at Red Letter Media. Um, and uh, there's a lot of geek commentary. That's uh, just something I always like to have on. So, um, but. Good luck to you, Freds. That's uh, and there, and the different kinds of gaming uh, is also, I think, a, a really interesting thing. There's a lot of creativity involved in that as well. Yeah, I like that. Freds um, also uh, calls himself the chief cat herder for Freds Dimension. <laughs> I mean, that really sums up like the, the 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 world of our creativity, right? It's like trying to herd cats sure. is also sure. like trying to put together all the ideas that are swirling around in your head that you wanna that you wanna turn into something tangible, right? Um, this is great that he's he's doing all of this stuff. But yes, I thought that was very amusing. Yeah. And also extra props for the fitting a tem into the tree of pharaohs, the family tree of pharaohs. Mm-hmm. I'm curious where I lined up in that lineage. I was always fascinated with Akhenaten, who was responsible for the Armana Revolution, which changed polytheism into monotheism very briefly. But then there was a revolt after. He was followed up by a, a slightly known um, pharaoh named Tutankhamun. Yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah, so Fred's Fred's Dimension, by the way, is spelled with a Z. Fred's, the Z is mm. after the D. Um, if anybody wants to look that up. And good luck to you, sir, and thanks for following us. Cool. Who do we go to next, my friend? Well, the next letter is from Malik. And Malik right. writes, Hi there, Dan and Eric. My name's Malik. Pronounced Malik. Well, thank you, Malik, for actually giving me the phonetics because that does <laughs> that does help. You know, the same thing when we're doing the stuff at uh, at the conventions and someone said, you know, sure, they, sure. They, they they write their name out for me, especially if I'm ever appearing in Ireland. Um, and I just want to <laughs> say thanks for doing this podcast. I've been listening to you guys in some capacity for most of my life, and it's great hearing you two share your stories, advice, and life experiences. You guys also joke about each other's cooking a fair bit, but jokes on you. Now that you've got me legit curious. 
Dan and Eric, what? Oh, oh, this is good. Dan and Eric, what would you guys say your signature dish dishes is? Are something you'd want to wow each other with if you cooked for one another? Also, what is your personal favorite comfort food? Sound off if you dare. Keep up the fantastic work, Malik. Well, first of all, great question. Because awesome question. I think we I think we uh, uh, mentioned this in in the last episode. We don't necessarily pre-read these. So, like, my my initial reaction to this is on the fly, right? And uh, I, <laughs> if you could see me in the booth, I was grinning the minute I we got to the cooking part. That's just so funny. Um, well, since I am probably not the better of the two cooks, um, I'm going to throw no, this one to I you, Dan, to answer first on what your what you'd cook for me. And then I'll tell you what I'd cook for you, and then we could also say what our personal favorites are. You rarely eat meat. That is true. I do not eat beef or pork, but I eat chicken and fish. Um, that I'm a big fan of that. Okay. So for you, I might do something simple like, um, like salmon with mm-hmm. asparagus. Okay. And some, you know maybe some basmati rice. Nice. Um, and what's great about salmon is that there's you don't really have to do a lot with it. You know, Maybe you squeeze some lemon juice on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, you can put some seasoning on it, but uh, the, the meat itself is so rich with flavor. Um, and asparagus is a, is a common pairing to that. Yes. Uh, you could maybe put some butter or garlic butter on it. That, that might be nice. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and the, and the rice is a nice uh, you know, palate cleanser, as it were. But um, so for you, that's what I would make for you. And those are not hard things to make. I no. would steam the asparagus um, and, uh, you know, you could either put the, the salmon in the oven or in a pan. doesn't really matter. depends on kind of what texture you're going for on the outside. And, uh, you know, rice is rice. So yes, I that's like what that. I would do. And I would eat that. And I would eat all of that. Um, all right. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that I'm also leaning towards the fish thing because that's one of my favorite things to make. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a master of many things in the kitchen, uh, but I do know how to, to cook fish. Um, I would actually make you a swordfish steak. Um, Ooh. Yes. I would, I would first, I would marinate it overnight in a sesame ginger dressing. That's that's a really mm. great flavor to mix mm-hmm. with that. Okay, and uh, marinades are a great way to to liven up any dish. Yes, yeah, I, I they're not I, hard to do, and I, yeah, I love that with fish. Uh, you know, I'm a big tuna steak guy. Yeah, I'm also sure. sword, but swordfish sure. steak. That's what I would do. Um, so I would grill that. Um, uh, not not overcooking it because swordfish can get very dry. So not super mm-hmm. rare like like a tuna steak would be, but definitely uh, on the on on the medium rare side. Um, and mm-hmm. and as your vegetable, because we have to eat that stuff, I would go out on a limb because mm-hmm. um, I, I I make a vegetable that there is definitely there are definitely two sides to this vegetable. There is I hate it more than anything, or it's one of my favorites, and that is Brussels sprouts. Oh, I love those. Uh, good. I would make you roasted Brussels sprouts um, yeah, along that's the way with I that, like them. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A little crispy on the outside. Um, and of course, um, we would have to at least finish the meal with uh, a single malt scotch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which we both have enjoyed with each other. That's right. That's right. So that yeah, that, that would so that's <laughs> comf- great. Yeah. <laughs> now now I just want to go eat. I know, um, right? I what's, like, <laughs> what's your favorite comfort food? <laughs> My favorite comfort food um, would probably be sushi. I could probably eat sushi mm. all, all, all the time. Um, I just had, uh, you know, one of our hangout movie nights with with my. Actually, no, we were watching uh, we were watching football. I, I'm sorry, it wasn't a movie. And I, it was football. We were watching a football game together, and um, I was like, "Well, what do you want to have tonight?" And my wife said, "Let's do sushi." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, twist my arm, okay." Um, and it just, <laughs> it's just I I even have the um, the 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 types of plates and uh, uh, for presentation. Um, I like to oh, I like yeah. to take the sushi from the styrofoam um, you know takeout uh, container and lay it out nicely the way that I would see it in the restaurant with my sure. you know w- you know with my chopsticks and the little you know uh, you know stand that it sits on like I'm and even the little tray the little dish to hold my my soy sauce and my and my wasabi like I'm I'm really into the presentation part of it so it's my comfort food and also um, I don't know. I like the way it looks. 
Now, what about you? Part of part of the comforting is you're treating yourself. Yeah, it's you're you're, yeah. Make, you're you're continuing to make it special even in its display. Yeah, I love it. I love presentation. It. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, that's great. I like that. I think of comfort more as something that's easy, kind oh. of like a you know, like you're. You, Taking something out of a survival kit, and so for me that would be it's very Batman. A filet mignon. Um, <laughs> well, your bat. How did this get in my bag? Uh, <laughs> that explains the smell. Um, oatmeal. Believe it or not, I know it sounds boring, no. but I find oatmeal very comforting. It's always good for you, so you can't really uh, OD on oatmeal either. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and it you know it, it leaves you feeling pretty full, pretty you know satisfied. It does, it and it's a great base yeah. for for things. You know, oh, the, yeah, like you can jazz fruit, it up. Yeah, you can keep it simple. Yeah, yeah, honey in it. Sure. Yeah, no, I love that. But I actually I do like it pretty simple. Like maybe just a little cinnamon, maybe just a little bit of walnuts. Oh, okay, um, nice. Yeah. So oatmeal always satisfying. Um. So I guess you're next. Who do we have? Okay, and next we have Chelsea. And Chelsea has to say, hello to you both. Hmm. Hello, Chelsea. Hello. I don't know that there are enough words to really convey how meaningful your work was to me in my youth, and still is to this day. I first saw Yu-Gi-Oh! when I was 13 years old, and it got me through a lot of difficult times with school and feeling lonely and misunderstood. I related to most of the characters and cherished those stories. I began drawing and creating stories of my own because Yu-Gi-Oh! inspired me at that pivotal age— there wasn't a Saturday I'd miss when a new episode would air. Kazuki Takahashi's recent passing really hurt. I think all of us felt that one very deeply. I am so thankful to him for creating the world of Yu-Gi-Oh!, but I am also thankful to Dan and Eric for bringing these characters to life on screen. I have never been able to meet either of you in person, but maybe one day. I'm just so happy that you all were able to come together to work on the Dark Side of Dimensions film. I was so incredibly excited for that reunion and amazed everyone sounded terrific and the animation was gorgeous. It was definitely very emotional for me to see the characters I grew up with again. I will always carry the original Yu-Gi-Oh! story in my heart. Aww. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for that letter. Um, yeah, I mean, that so much of that means so much to, to both of us. I know working on the, on the, on the movie was amazing that we were able to come back together and do that. Um, sure, yeah, yeah. But even just... And that inspired us to, to form Andromeda. That's right. That is true. That is true. And just the, the, the idea of being able to work on a project where you actually have a chance to meet the creator of the characters you're playing and... Um, and you know the 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 story and the characters are bigger than uh, the two actors that play them. Um, sure, but or it, the many actors that play them. That's true, but the, the, the two the two English dub actors that play them. <laughs> um, but uh, I think after so many years, and we're about to come up on the 25th anniversary um, of Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, amazing. Um, I just think that uh, my goodness, the, at least for me, like Kaiba is in my blood. Like, it, like this is something that I feel so connected to the character, the, you know, uh, I will defend his, his behavior. Sure. I will, sure. I will, I, you know, all of the stuff that, that, that he is. Um, I'm glad that, uh, Chelsea found these characters, um, inspiring to do, um, an original piece. That's fantastic. Uh, Yes, but I want to get back to just what you said about that character being available for you. Another geek reference, Captain America is one of my favorite characters, but probably the cinematic version of him, as portrayed by Chris Evans, is the best interpretation. And yes. I have so much respect for the original material. I'm a comics guy. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a really great interpretation of that character. And Chris Evans himself said that he learned from that character, that that uh, sense of having this very duty-bound core to mm -hmm. an ethical purpose, uh, which isn't to say that he was unethical beforehand, but right. it, it furthered that sensibility in him. Um, I'm paraphrasing what he said, and I think we find that from, we, we learn about ourselves portraying characters, but we also learn from the characters we portray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and getting back to what you were saying about how this motivated Chelsea's own creativity mm -hmm. um, is always, it's always a great thing to hear. So and and thanks for for continuing to hold these things so dearly in your heart. I recently saw 
uh, the the Indiana Jones film Dial of Destiny, and they did a you know a de aging on Harrison Ford, and and so it was you know kind of like reuniting with that version of of a character from so long ago, um, and that was definitely a, a a nice thing to see. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and you have a guy um, cosplay Batman for you like every month or so. Or is it like- <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love. It's funny. I I. Uh, um, when I first started to uh, make a convention, that guy's name is Christian Bale too, yeah. and worth every penny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say about the but the Batman stuff. So I, I um, when I first started doing conventions, I mentioned that I was a huge <laughs> Batman fan, and yeah. slowly fans would give me Batman things, which was fun. Um, but I have uh, at least three Snuggies. Full on snuggies. <laughs> uh, I have I have the original. Um, I have the gray and blue um, <laughs> Batman outfit. I have um, uh, I have a weird one that I don't know what the what the correlation is. It's so, sort of like a uh, a tan and gold one. It kind of looks like someone at McDonald's hmm. made it. <laughs> Maybe it was McDonald's <laughs> license. Yeah, right. Um, but but I have them and they're very very comfortable on a chilly night to wear when I have to fight crime. I, I didn't say that. Out loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Just side track. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, good luck with your creativity. Uh, I said it last episode. I've said it before, but it is its own reward. So, uh, but share it with the world because uh, sometimes uh, that, that works out really well for everybody. <laughs> yes. yes. Moving on. Who's next? Let's see. Next is D. Spelled with D E and E. So not just the letter D, but the word D. Yes, from D. Dear Dan and Eric, thank you again for making my childhood fantastic. Oh, thank you, D. You guys Mm -hmm. have always inspired me to do great things, and thankfully you still do. Though I am way older than the target Yu Gi Oh audience, okay, I'm 31, lol. Well, okay. Well, that's just, you know, that's... that's... We've heard this story before. Don't feel ashamed. That's right. Uh, I couldn't be more grateful to still have you both in my life, since I fell in love with both Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! after 9-11. Love and happiness to you both. Oh, well, thank you so much. That is really very nice, Dee. Appreciate that. And, um... Yeah, I, I mean, ma- mentioning uh, when you first fell in love with uh, Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, yeah. I mean, we just... At the time we record this, yeah. uh, it's it's just a couple days after the yeah. 11th. That's right, that's right. And, uh, yeah, um, you know, that so much of uh, so much of that day is also wrapped around what we were doing that day. Um, you know, yeah. and we were, you know, I was in the, I was in the studio, so uh, working yep. on this stuff, so... The, yeah. the very first episode was to air earlier than it did because of the tragedy of that time. Mm-hmm. The news was all about, appropriately, right. uh, those, those events, but... Um, yeah, so I, I I can't think of Yu-Gi-Oh without thinking of 9/11. Mm-hmm. And and D is also talking about being inspired to do you know uh, original stuff as well, and that's and that's great. Um, mm-hmm. um, I also th- I think it's funny mentioning the age. Um, so I don't know about you, Dan, <laughs> but I, but I'm sure this occurs to you every time we're making appearances. Um, a, a family will come up to us, and uh, yeah. the kids will hand us the Yu-Gi-Oh cards to to sign or whatever it is. Right. And and I and I look I look at the kid and I say, "This isn't really for you, is it? It's for for your parents or your dad or your mom." And they're like, and then of course the dad's like, "Yeah." <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, even though there is definitely the younger generation that is uh, that might be the quote unquote target audience for the show, um, you know, it's been on for a long time, so. Those that were ten years old are now in their thirties. Yeah, you're yeah. you're at the perfect age, D. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and I sometimes encounter people who get into it uh, when they're in their twenties, like they're mm-hmm. you know they've just more recently become fans, which yeah uh, blows me away. I think that's awesome. Definitely. So um, nothing to be ashamed of there, D. No. <laughs> and good luck with all your creativity. Yes, very cool. All right, Dan. What what do we have next? So next we have a letter from Lindsay. Dear Dan and Eric, hello, I am a big fan of the Heart of the Cards podcast. Uh Yay! Yay, yes. (laughs) And Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh, Oh, that thing. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know about Yu-Gi-Oh till I was 13 years old. 
I am a great fan of Yugi and a Tem. Sorry, Eric. It's oh, fine. Don't worry. <laughs> he gets plenty of praise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Even from other people than himself. Yeah, that's right. And what, hey, and what caused me to relate to Yugi and a Tem was their personalities. Especially a Tem, when we got to see how socially awkward he is. As a freshman, I was judged by my friends for liking Yu-Gi-Oh. They also said that after I get shown something, I immediately take interest and ruin it for other people. Hmm. Wow, that's a lot to put on you. Yeah. Me being 19 and new to being on my own, Yu-Gi-Oh! is there for me to make me laugh and feel comforted. I really appreciate your guys' work. Eric, I've also become a fan of your music. Oh, it's you. amazing. And as for the podcast, I listen to an episode or two for my last hour of work, and it lifts my spirits to hear you guys talk and make me laugh. Thank you for that. Sincerely, Lindsay. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. That's very affirming. Yeah. <laughs> we all go through socially awkward things, mm -hmm. too. I, uh, but your friends blaming you for ruining stuff, that's pretty lame. <laughs> yeah, I mean, being excited about a show or being ex excited about anything and wanting to share that. I mean, yes, okay. So sometimes people want to do some spoilers and when you're planning to go see that movie. But, you know, I, <laughs> but, but I don't think that's what you were doing. Um, you were just probably excited about this and, and wanted to get other people involved. So, yeah. And I like that you put the quotes around the words friends because the people that behave like that, I would not call them yeah, your friends. Yeah, those were your friends words. should not judge you for liking Yu-Gi-Oh. No, no, <laughs> not at all. Um, and you want us to make you laugh. I mean, that's the whole point, too. So um, honestly, um, yeah. you know, uh, uh, this is a heartfelt letter, and we really appreciate that. Um, we'll try our best to be funny in this podcast for you. <laughs> <laughs> No pressure. No. Totally natural. No, not at all. <laughs> well, I'm and I'm heartened that you have this as a support for you, you know, when when you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very happy to hear that what we're putting out there has some value to to our listeners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you for that, Lindsay. Uh, who's next, Eric? Let's see. It looks like the next letter is from Ash. Okay. Let's see what Ash has to ask. Um, Ash says, I recently left a series of decades long. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. I was on a journey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still on it. Um, no, no. Ash does not write that this time. Ash writes. Different Ash. Uh, long time listener, first time messenger here. Before I ask you my question, I would like to thank both of you and retro slash prospectively all the guests you've had and are to have on the show. You are all beacons of light entertainment and best practice in your respective industry. Okay. Thank you for many years of dedication and resilience throughout your own personal and professional experiences. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for noticing. Well, I'm, I, yeah, uh, I'm, I feel very validated. Yeah, thank you. Um, I recall from an interview many years ago that yourselves at 4Kids slash Yu-Gi-Oh believed that in light of the disaster that was 9-11, that you had mm. to keep working for the children who are watching your shows to provide them with a form of escapism from all that was wrong in the world, something that over the past few years I'm sure we can all relate to. However, as we have also seen, many of the world's problems can come from escapism slash a disconnect from reality turning into delusion and eventually problems that can sometimes seem irreparable. Fame director Hideki Anno is someone in your industry who has made quite possibly the most thought-provoking Japanese animated series, Evangelion, on this mm. very matter, but abstains from the folly of escapism due to his own experiences with people and mental health. To surmise, I would like to know what Eric and yourself think about the fine balance between reality and escapism and how one can walk this line without losing oneself. Thank you and best wishes to you all. P.S. After listening to your podcast so far and the range of philosophical topics you've covered, I thought this would be perfect for you to answer. Okay. Well, first of all, I, a well-written letter. My goodness, yes. Ash. Wow. <laughs> and thank you for thinking that we have <laughs> what we need to be philosophical about anything uh, and have it worth listening to. That's a compliment. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so... I love this question, and it's true. I, I'm not sure 
what words you've you've applied to that with you know nine eleven and 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 providing a you know a form of entertainment. I know that I've said something. I was coming back to the booth after it happened and then, and feeling very disconnected to well, as a lot of New Yorkers did at the time to you know the, the common day to day routine just seemed absurd. Whatever you were doing, right? Um, and uh, so, but I needed to be present for the performance. And I thought, well, if if I'm good for anything in this moment, maybe I can contribute to a form of entertainment that provides kids with something to. Um, to enjoy, to you know, or to escape from, or whatever, and that's absolutely true. I still feel that way to this day. The thing is, we don't expect kids to solve the problems we face in reality, and escapism is potentially, yes, an unhealthy thing if that's your only reaction to the challenges that that you are presented with, because those challenges can't be escaped. You have to face them as an adult. And I think the proper combination, to put it succinctly as possible, is balance. And sometimes you can face the monster, sometimes you can slay the dragon, and sometimes you need to get away from the stress of that so that you can recover and address the situation more effectively. But always hiding never answers anything, never solves anything. So it has to be a balance. Yeah, and I I have to say that um, my uh, recollection of that moment um, because obviously we didn't know all of the details when we had to then oh, turn yeah. around and get yeah. back to work, right? Um, yeah. we, we watch stuff on the on the television and then, you know, in the, in the main... You were in the studio. I was in the studio. So I, I watched it. We had a giant screen television in the lobby and we watched... We, the whole company stood there and watched it. And um, well, at least when the first plane uh, hit and, and we were like, mm-hmm. okay, that's, this, is, this is terrible. But we didn't know what the details really were. And then we yeah. were told to go back to work. Um, but like any sort of traumatic experience, even though um, probably looking back now, um, I can say that I was so numb to just the confusion of everything that yeah. Um, yeah. I I didn't even think, oh, well, we've got to get to making these cartoons so that there is this escapism <laughs> and there is this entertainment so that, that I, I don't think yeah. that was even, I was not on my radar. What was on my radar was pretty much what is going on and why am I now going back to doing this? Like, right. you know, right. I, I don't think I could really even focus on what I was doing, even though, you know, we were told, let's let's get back to work. And, you know, as we find out more information, we'll let everybody know. Um, right, right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I do believe that sometimes we have to be gentle of how we expose uh, younger kids to certain things, um, not to Agreed. keep it from them, but... To, to find the right time and the, and the right process. Way. Um, yeah. I think early on in our podcast, we might have even d- discussed this if we, if we, if we did, and I'm repeating myself, um, the story that, that uh, rings true with me um, from that time was pretty much a week after, um, after 9-11. Um, my, my, my older daughter um, was uh, just a little kid. And mm-hmm. um, because of where we lived in Brooklyn Heights, which was right across the water, um, our entire neighborhood, from the every car in the street to all the buildings, everything was covered in the soot and debris um, right. F- from, right. from the Twin Towers. And um, we had kept um, our daughter from watching the news. Um, yep. And... Uh, but it was pretty apparent as she's watching people walking around crying and, uh, and you know, mm-hmm. and, and all of this debris. And she asked um, my ex-wife, um, she said, um, what's all this dirt around? And um, her mother said, um, well, that's pieces from the building that fell down and um, it's just everywhere. And so my daughter said, well, mm-hmm. because I was a very handy dad, I, I do a lot of DIY stuff. My my daughter mm-hmm. said, well, let's gather up all the pieces because uh, daddy oh. can fix anything. Oh. So That's so sweet. So like I – it took me a while to even have that conversation because in my mind, that's all that really needed to be discussed at that time. That's that's fine. Right. Let, you know, okay, then that's what I'm going to do. But of course, we're still actually comprehending what that was all about. Yes. People are still suffering yes. from res- trying to rescue others from that event. And 
I also had to, uh, my, my children weren't born at that time. I hadn't even yet the woman who would become their mother. Right. But they're, because it was just a couple of days ago, they're learning about it. And while they knew something about it, they're getting old enough to more, to be able to comprehend things uh, more deeply. And yeah. And, and also, I mean, the same sort of consideration for what's appropriate for them at this moment right now. Mm Mm-hmm. And and they understand better what the what death is. Oh, they understand the idea of tragedy. Um, and and it, you know, it's a, it, even just talking about it now, even though it hadn't just happened, is still something you have to be careful about. Sure, with sure. a younger person. Sure, yeah. and I'm not I'm not a big <clears throat> censorship person at all. Um, Never. At, no. At, at, don't, um, no. Don't censor. Don't no. take things out. But there's definitely, you know, with the sensationalism of news stations also trying to get the story, you know, be the first one to break the story mm. or or, mm-hmm. or get the ratings and things like that. Um, you know, I, as we were just experiencing the, the, you know, the tragedy again, as we're as we're as we see these stories, um, you know, every year. And yes, the words yeah. never forget. Um, resonate in my life, you know, it's a different, you know, it it was definitely a tragedy for America, but I am going to tell you that being a New Yorker, that, you know, that changed my life, that changed my life. Um, And so, uh, you know, this idea of showing, as I was watching some of the news things, it'd been a long time since I'd seen the footage, the real Mm. footage uh, you know the things that they yep. that they they kept off of the news for a long time, yeah. but it it yeah. almost seems like well it's been so many years we can show this again. That's not going to make the difference between whether I remember or forget. You know, um, no. And I think that if a small child was watching that on the news, that might be too too much. Too much. Too much. And it and be, because it doesn't have enough of a context to be in proper balance exactly. with other things. Exactly. And. Um, and uh, we'll move on to the next letter, yeah. but uh, as a parting thought, you and I both were as stunned, you know, what to do next, what's going on. The unfolding of the information when the first plane hit, we weren't sure what was, we didn't know it was a terrorist attack. Exactly. Nobody knew for sure what was going on. Right. And and so the unfolding of the information is another element, but also, you know, reapplying yourself to this idea of normalcy is something I think... Everyone struggled with across the nation, but especially those people in the attack areas, not mm-hmm. just New York. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there was the Pentagon and, and, and I mean, the, the family members of the flight that went down where, you know, the, the, the passengers revolted. Mm-hmm. Um, but this coming back to normalcy took a long time. I was trying to explain to my kids that, you know how, you know, New York is, is you know, kind of fast paced and everybody's got their energy going on and that's part of the fun and maybe sometimes part of the annoyance of being in New York. And they, they were born in New York and we lived in New York and we visit New York. And um, I was trying to describe that kind of stunned state people were in for weeks mm-hmm. afterward. You know, it, like everyone almost was moving in somewhat of a slow motion um, is, is kind of how I uh, think of it. But it took a long time to get those steps following one another with more assurance yes. because it was so destabilizing. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So anyway. All right. Well, so that's our philosophical response to that. Yes. And uh, great question. Very great good. Question. Yes. Thanks. All right. And well, as a side note, yes. uh, uh, bef- before we move on, and we'll reiterate this, when we th- we're going to do letters again, part of our consideration was maybe we should you know, give some sort of focus as opposed to putting it on the fans to say what they should say in these letters, very often people feel like they need to tell us that they really admire our work. And we love hearing that. But we're also perhaps even more interested in these kinds of conversations um, that go beyond what you know us for and and help to create an, an interchange that can take us to new places. Yeah, yeah. I mean, both with the the the, the, the this is the... The depth of this one, which is definitely a little bit more emotional, very hard for uh, for both of us to even discuss uh, that day. Um, to the lighthearted cooking one, I, I mean, th- this this yeah yeah that's th- fun. That's it's fun stuff. So so thank you, thank you for these interesting letters. All right, what do you have next? Our next letter is from Valerie, huh, okay. who is one of our biggest supporters. Uh, Valerie took the effort to promote the heart of the cards, especially. Uh, uh, in in a number of ways, this is a 
a letter from a while ago, um, so this may not be uh, completely up to date. But what Valerie has to say is this. Hey, Dan and Eric. Hey. My name is Valerie, and I've been a huge fan of your work in both Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! since I was little. Oh, so this is from way back, because we've met Valerie a number of times Mm. by now. Yeah, we have. I watched both animes every day, collected the cards, and played the games religiously. (laughs) Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon have been my escape from the dark times in my life. We've certainly heard that before. As I enter my 30s this year, I am still a fan of the shows to this day. I relate to Yugi and Brock in so many ways, and they both inspire me to keep appreciating the friends I have. That's always a good thing, unless they tease you for liking Mm Yu-Gi-Oh. I recently lost a friendship of six years in October of last year, and both shows have helped me get through it. So I want to thank you both for all of your amazing work over the years. I'm sorry. Breaking up with a friend is so hard. Yep. Yes. I also relate to Yugi because I was extremely close with my grandpa all throughout my childhood. He even took me to see the first three Pokemon movies when they came out in theaters and bought me my very first deck of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Another memory from my childhood is when my dad used to bring back anything Pokemon every time he came back from training for the Raiders when he played for the NFL. Cool. (laughs) You guys might be wondering who my dad is. His name is Jeff Gossett. He used to listen to your music all the time, Eric, Mm. and watched Pokemon with me every morning before I went to school. He was always so impressed by both of you and the characters you guys played. I want to thank you both for being a huge part of my childhood and even being part of my adulthood. I can't wait to finally meet you guys. Valerie. P.S. I have a quick question. If Yu-Gi-Oh! came back for another season, where do you think Yugi, Yami, and Kaiba would be? What would they be doing since the last season? Hmm. Okay. Well, first of all, it's nice to actually meet you, Valerie. We, we had a great time meeting you. A couple of times we've seen you. So, uh, yes. So hopefully you were not disappointed <laughs> since this letter was written before you met us. We didn't let you down. <laughs> um, I like that you uh, connect Yugi and Brock um, as the two characters yeah, that meet I, so much. I see it. Because the two I of them it. could also go to school together. Sure. Like Brock could have been in their class. They could. They would both have been in the same reject section of class. Yeah, Brock would be cooking though. That's the whole thing. He would be well, like there's, the homemade. Yeah, yeah. You know, right, yeah. But would he be making roasted Brussels? <laughs> no, no, no. He's trying to get a date, <laughs> not scare them away. Um, I see. Wow. Uh, I'm just going to say one other thing. Very cool that your dad played for the NFL as a football fan. Um, I just love football. I mean, yes, I have my rivalries and things like that, but I just love football in general. So that's pretty cool. Yes, and um, I've always been impressed at the multiple times we've met um, that you are, uh, I mean, you're so kind and, and generous and supportive. Um, so that alone really stands out, and I'm so uh, grateful for that. Grateful doesn't seem like exactly the right word, but that's included in, in, in that. Yeah, so it, it's wonderful to have your support. And uh, even though Eric is more of a sports guy than I am, yeah, sure, it's cool to know that not only uh, the kids who are growing up watching it like the shows, but their parents like the shows. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we get to have, uh, you know, conversations with whole families sometimes. And that's really sweet to to imagine something that we've done being part of a, a family event or, or ritual, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and it means a lot to us both. And I know that we will be seeing you in the future. I'm going to be seeing you soon. Eric, I'm not sure if you're able to go to that convention. but um, And again, thanks for all that you've done to promote this podcast. I'm glad that it, you know, it's offered you something. And, and sorry about the breakups. Yeah. You know, the... Uh, um, yeah, you in this letter have discussed a breakup with a friend. You shared with me in socials uh, another form of breakup. And I'm just glad that we're a part of what is helpful for you to, you know, get through something and, and get back to who you are and where you want to go. Yeah, and I apologize to your grandpa for having to sit through all of those movies with you. Um, uh, hopefully he found them <laughs> funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I love my work. <laughs> but that's very sweet. That's very, that's a, that's, that seems like a very sweet story. I, I, I also had a great relationship with my, uh, my mother's father, my grandpa, Paul. He was, uh, he was a, a, a funny man, a very funny man. So that's, that's nice that you have that memory. Well, Eric, we've come to another almost hour of stuff My for goodness. our podcast, and usually we don't go over that. Okay. Um, but there are more letters I think we'll have to save for another time. Yeah. 
That, yeah, that's a good idea. And, and and these are, I mean, it's so much fun to 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 feel this connection and 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 share these stories that people have written us and um and getting it. I mean, you know, we don't always have a chance to talk to everyone in great lengths when yeah. we're when we're yeah. at the events. And you know, we try our best. You know, it's that fine line between moving the lines along and and taking the questions in the Q and A and and also sure. just giving yeah. and giving everybody their time. Um. I almost feel like this is a great way to make up for some of that because um, we do have a we have, yeah. we have a conversation. We actually have a conversation yeah. with yeah. with these people who who have written to us. So it, it means a lot. And we should do this reading of letters more than every six months or so. Um, you you have a, more to say, and we have uh, the interest in in what you have to say. We're also just learning how to do the podcast thing. So um, maybe we should do letters like I don't know once a month or so. Yeah, um, that could work. Yeah, 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 for sure. And we understand that you know the varying lengths of our podcast. You know, for some people they want the you know same amount all the time. Um, and uh, maybe if we did letters more frequently, uh, we could keep it within that. That sweet spot, I think, where people want more of the half hour thing or whatever. But of course, if you have uh, an opinion about how long you'd like these podcasts to be, <laughs> please let us know <laughs> in a letter. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, you can go to our website at Andromeda Productions and you will find the Heart of the Cards tab on the upper right hand part of the menu. You click on that. And that will take you to the form you can fill out and submit whatever you have to say um, uh, to either Eric or I or the fan base or the world in general. And we'd be happy to respond to that. Yes. All right. Well, Eric, thanks as always for being a part of this conversation. Yes. Thank you, Dan. It was fun. Absolutely. And thank you to everyone who's been listening and following, those of you who wrote letters, those of you who are still listeners and yet to write, we appreciate all of you and everything you have to say. Uh, and don't forget to make comments. Uh, I'll try to be better at getting back to those. Um, but uh, I, again, I, I like the activity and and, uh, and I know that there are some regular people uh, that uh, that are always commenting on YouTube. But if you're not one of them, uh, go ahead and comment. There's some, there's some good interactions to be found on there. And, of course, there's the like and subscribe thing that we have to say. Mm -hmm. um, so, but please do that because of, you, well, you know how YouTube is. Uh, YouTube wants us to do those sorts of things. Um, and uh, I hope that this has been fun uh, for everyone, even if you didn't write something. And we always look forward to the next time we can have a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Thanks for listening to The Heart of the Cards with Dan Green and Eric Stewart. We hope this conversation in some way spoke to you. Whatever your journey, we look forward to crossing paths again in the next episode. This is Veronica Taylor, and on behalf of Andromeda Productions, we wish you well. Andromeda, always a sound choice.